Welcome. We're glad to see you back for another session on the gospel storyline. We've been making the argument that the gospel is a drama. It's the drama of redemption. It is a theodrama. That is, God is the one that is saying things and doing things. This is part of the Grace Ministry Training Network. Uh, again, I apologize that I can't be with you in person. Uh, I will be back with you next week. Uh, and so we have taped this uh, to uh, provide a way that we uh, don't lose ground. Let me just take a moment to review where we've been so far. This is week four. The first week we talked about why God would create this world really as a stage on which he would display his glory and would invite people in to fellowship and communion with him. The second week, we talked about the creation of Adam and Eve and this covenant of creation that God entered in with them, uh, their rise and their fall, and how their sin really set the stage for God to display his mercy and redemption. Last week, we saw the plot thicken. Uh, as evil increased, as wickedness multiplied, and God responded with a global flood that destroyed all of humanity except Noah and his children. And God formally entered into a covenant with Noah, a covenant that continues even to this day. But we came to Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel, uh, the darkest point in all of the storyline of the Bible. It's dark, it's without hope, uh, there's uh, no promise that's connected with that, but immediately flowing out of that, we really have uh, a, a, a new Adam. Actually, in some respects, the last Adam. His name is Abraham. We call him Father Abraham, and we're going to use the phrase, the channel of blessing. He becomes the means through which the blessing of God is going to flow through all of the earth. It's impossible to overstate the importance of Abraham in the storyline of the Bible. In fact, in Matthew 1, verse 1, first verse in the New Testament, says the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. The three main characters, not the only characters, but the three main characters in this developing drama are Abraham and his great-great-great-grandson, King David, and his great-great-great-grandson, Jesus Christ. All of the story is built around them. We could literally spend hours going through all that uh, the scripture has to say about Abraham. We're going to pr try to reduce that down into a manageable portion uh, uh, this evening. Let me just take a moment to tell you what we're going to be looking at. With Abraham, there is the countering of the bad effects of Babel. And and hope is being planted. We're going to look at Abraham as the father of promise. We're going to uh, uh, go to Genesis 15 where a covenant is actually cut and made with Abraham. The smoking fire pot is going to walk between the animals while Abraham is in a deep sleep. We're going to look at uh, uh, Genesis 17 and uh, the covenant sign that is established, the uh, sign of circumcision. Uh, we're going to talk about the covenant oath. God actually swears. He swears by himself. The book of Hebrews picks that up. We're going to talk about the covenant task. What is the task that is assigned to Abraham? It is to bless, to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And from that, we want to show how the mission of God is completely parallel to the mission of Abraham and how the Church of Jesus Christ takes that up in the Great Commission. And then conclude with recognizing if Abraham is the father of promise, then Jesus Christ is the seed that was promised, and all of this is going to point forward to Jesus Christ. So that is a quick overview. Now, let's take a moment and go back and review 
the uh, situation that we encountered at the end of uh, Genesis chapter 11. Uh, darkness shrouds the earth. Uh, there is a hopelessness that prevails. Uh, uh, Babel and the people uh, said, we will make a name for ourselves. And of course, we saw the, the uh, foolish failure and how they uh, embarrassed themselves in trying to do that. Uh, and in fact, God, who said, I'll make a name for myself, uh, makes a statement here where he says, I will make Abram's name great. And in fact, if you go through the scripture, you'll only find three people that it specifically says they had a great name. The first of those is Abraham. The second of those is David. God was going to give him a name like the greatest men of the earth. And the third is Jesus Christ, who has a name given that's above every name. And it's more than coincidental that Matthew 1 begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The greatness of Abraham is not going to be generated by his accomplishments, but God is going to make his name great. And so with Babel, the language is confused of the people. They don't understand one another. And because of that, the project is scuttled. The work stops on this tower that they were going to build. And the people are scattered. And cultural barriers now are erected between people who no longer can communicate and speak freely with one another. And what we encounter in here is a fresh start. And in many respects, a new Adam, and I want to argue the last Adam uh, in Abraham. Just as we talked about with Noah, there is kind of a fresh start that goes back to similarities with creation. The same thing is going to be true with Abraham. Uh, Abram is the man who's going to bring order out of utter chaos. And you'll notice at the beginning we're dealing with Abram, and later on his name will be changed to Abraham. And so before we get to the name change, we're going to try to stay with Abram uh, and then change that to Abraham when we come to that part in the text. But I, I was struck by a parallel that uh, Peter Gentry brought out. Some of you may remember the program, uh, if you're old enough to, My Three Sons. Uh, and there's a very interesting parallel with this, that Adam had three sons that are named, Cain and Abel. Uh, Abel was killed, and then in his place there was Seth. And Seth becomes the line through which the promise is going to develop. And then there was a man named Noah, and he had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And it was through Shem that this promise is going to continue. Well, when we come to the end of chapter 11, we have another man named Terah. And he had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Abram is going to be the one that uh, uh, is going to be the agent through which God is going to work and this promise is going to flow. Now, those three men with three sons, it's not just coincidental, but it really is a literary device that Scripture uses to make a connection with all three of them. And in Abram, we now have the promise that was made earlier that's going to be fulfilled. And so what we have with Abram is a promised future. Uh, Babel, there was no hope, there was no promise, there was no future. But now as Abram is introduced, there's a promised future. Uh, Abram is going to be the channel of blessing. Uh, the curse and the darkness and the judgment of God flow from sin and God's response to man's sin. But the heart of God is not cursing and judgment. The heart of God is blessing. And so through Abram is going to come this fruitful rest 
that was promised to Adam and he forfeited, re-promised to Noah and he forfeited, is going to be reinstituted by Abram. There's a global dimension to this. This is not a local story, but it's global in terms of the people, all the ethnos, all the nations. It's global in terms of the geographic scope of this, and it's global in the sense of the time frame. It is going to uh, 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 take us from beginning all the way to the end. And what I want you to notice, it's not as though uh, Abram is this hero that comes riding in on a white horse and he makes things happen. This is a divine initiative. This is a theodrama. This is what God is doing. God is going to do something amazing. He's going to do something that's great. He's going to do something that's redemptive. I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bible. We'll be walking through these sections of Scripture, so it may be helpful to have your Bible handy. I want to read the first three verses of Genesis 12. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's impossible to overstate how important that statement is. In these three verses, God speaks to Abram. The Lord said to Abram, we've made the point that our God is a talking God. And he spoke to Adam. He's spoken at many points along the way. Now he speaks to Abram. And he gives Abram two commands. The first command that he gives to Abram is to go. And you'll see that on the slide uh, marked with C. Uh, he's told to leave, to, to leave his homeland, his people, everything that uh, he's familiar with. Think of this for a moment. Imagine God saying to you in the middle of the night, okay, get a U-Haul, pack it up, get on the road. I want you to leave your job, your family, your home, and I'll tell you where you're going. It gives you a sense of what's happening here. And so God issues a directive, a command to Abram, and that is to go. But with that command, there are three promises. Number one, I'll make you into a great nation. Number two, I will bless you. And number three, I will make your name great. Now, those promises are tied to Abram's obedience. Uh, they don't earn uh, anything. It's not something based on merit, but the two go hand in hand. And then what is sometimes confusing, if you read this in the NIV, it says, and you will be a blessing. It probably is better to be translated. This is a second command that he gives to Abram, and that is to be a blessing. Not only is he to go, but he is to be a blessing. And that follows with three promises. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And thirdly, in you, all nations will be blessed. Now, if we can understand these two directives, go and bless, that God gave to Abram, and the promise that God surrounded them with or embedded them in, we have a good chance of understanding the flow of this drama and the outworking of redemptive history. Everything is tied up uh, in what God is saying and doing here. We find this in the rest of Scripture. Psalm 105, verse 42, we read, God remembered his holy promise that he made to Abraham. You'll see this again and again and again. Our God is a God who makes promises. Now, God was not obligated to make a promise. God did that freely. 
But the God who freely made a promise obligates himself to keep that promise. And so in Genesis 12, we have the promise that by Genesis 15 is going to be formalized into a covenant that's actually cut. But Psalm 105 refers back to God remembering the holy promise that he made to Abraham. Now remembering, it's not in the sense of, well, I forgot it, and oh yeah, I just remembered. No, it's remembering in the sense that he's doing everything that he said he would do. The two New Testament passages that must really be understood if you're going to appreciate Genesis 12 is Romans 4 and Galatians 3. All of Romans 4 is about Abraham, and right in the very center of it, verse 13, it says the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world was not going to be through law, but it was going to be through this promise uh, that he made to Abraham. It's going to be established on grace. And I love the passage in Romans 4. Let me turn there for just a moment. Because in this passage, uh, Paul sets out that uh, the promise comes by faith. This is Romans 4, verse 16. And so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, he is the father of us all. Every believer by faith is a child of Abraham. And I love what he goes on to say uh, later on in verse 20. Abram did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Now, that's the foundation of Scripture. God made a promise and he kept the promise. I, I saw a statement recently that men, and good, uh, men of good intentions make promises, men of good character keep promises. So God's not like those who had good intentions, but God follows through. Galatians 3. Galatians 3, uh, really all of Galatians is critical to understanding the flow of redemptive history and how this drama is working out because it's going to show how law that was later made with Moses, how that is going to connect with Abraham. But I, I want you to notice the verse in Galatians 3 and verse 8 where it says that God announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. So what's happening here is uh, the gospel, the good news. Remember, we're arguing the gospel is drama. It's the story of what God is doing before Paul, before Jesus, before Isaiah. There is this promise that God made, and he pronounced and, and proclaimed the gospel ahead of time. Now, think with me. The promises that he made in Genesis chapter 12, you may want to turn back to them, are three in number. Uh, look carefully with me at this section. God said, I will make you into a great nation. Well, what God says, I'm going to give you a place. You're going to have a home. And throughout the Old Testament, if you look at the word promise, it's constantly attached to land. The promised land, the promised land, the promised land. Now, God could have just said Canaan, but he put that in there as a reminder that I'm going to give you a place. This is going to be your home. This is going to be where I'm going to dwell with you. Just as Adam had a place in the Garden of Eden, God is going to give to Abram, the, the last Adam, the new Adam, he's going to give him a place. So there's going to be a land. And he says, secondly, uh, I'm going to give you a seed, uh, an heir that is going to open the future to us so that all that God promised is going to take place. 
And as we read through the account, we're going to find out this is not such a simple thing. It was through many years of struggle that Abram finally received the heir that God promised. And at one point, there's clear doubt as to whether this is going to happen or not. The third promise is a name. Uh, I'm going to give you a great name. Well, what is that all about? Well, it's the idea of royalty. It's the idea of kingship that we talked about with Adam. And in many respe respects, Abram takes over that place as the steward. And he becomes the father of David, the great king of Israel, who becomes the father of the king of kings. You remember when the wise men came to Herod, we're looking for him who is born king of the Jews. And so those uh, three promises of a land and a seed and royalty uh, that uh, he is going to have a name that's above every name are at the heart of this. Now, when we talk about Abram, we have to talk about covenant. God made a promise in Genesis chapter 12. And as you read the accounts in chapter 12, uh, later on, because of the famine, they go to Egypt. And uh, that's where Abram tells a, a half-truth, half-lie that Sarah is his sister uh, and not his wife. And then in chapter 13, we have the account of Abram and Lot separating and the events that take place. Chapter 14, Abram rescues Lot. And uh, uh, in chapter 14, we have one of the most critical statements, and that's Abram's meeting with Melchizedek and how uh, Melchizedek blessed him. And Hebrews is going to pick this up and make the argument that the new covenant rests upon a mediator, not uh, Judah, not through the law, uh, uh, not through the temple, but it's going to come through another priesthood that of Melchizedek. So at the very heart of everything God is doing is this covenant. Well, a covenant has to be made. It has to be cut. And we're going to read about this account in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, I hope you'll turn there with me. Let's read it together. After this, this is Genesis 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And here is what God said to Abram. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. Now, God comes to reassure Abram that he hasn't forgotten about this promise that he can count on it. But at this point, Abram registers some doubt. We very often think of Abram as the man of faith, and he is, but let's not miss the fact that were points, there were points that Abram had some questions. And Abram said to God, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And see, Abram is saying, wait a minute, you promised me a seed, but all I have right now is a steward in my household. You haven't given me any children. Am I missing something here? And God is going to respond to him, came to him, verse 4, this man, Eliezer, will not be your heir, but a son coming out of your own body is going to be the heir. And then you remember, he took him outside, and he said, I want you to look up at the sky. Look at the stars that are there. If you can number them, that's going to be what your seed, your, your heritage, your children is going to be like. He said, so shall your offspring be. And then verse 6 is quoted over and over again. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is where Romans 4 picks up from there. And that was God's way of saying, you're going to have a son. But Abraham said, wait a minute, I got a second question, a second problem. Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I'll gain possession of it, of this land? God promised him a, a land. He promised him a seed. He doesn't have either. 
So the Lord said, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and ranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut. The birds of prey came down on the carcass, but Abram drove them away. Again, I'd encourage you to take some time to read Gentry's explanation of this in, in Kingdom Through Covenants. Let me hold it up again just as a reminder. You'll find uh, uh, some very helpful things, and there's far more detail in there than we can go to here. And he will uh, uh, open this up in greater detail for you. I want you to notice verse 12. Here is the heart of what God is doing. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Anything sound like creation and darkness and the Spirit of God hovering? Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. Now, how does he know that? Is that a good guess? No, he knows the storyline because he's the author of this. And he says, I'm telling you now what's going to happen. I want you to know what's in the storyline. Your descendants are going to be strangers in a country not their own, and they're going to be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I'll punish that nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they'll come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried in a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Now, God's giving them a picture into what's going to happen. Now, listen to this dramatic scene. When the sun had set, and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. You remember the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire? You remember on Mount Sinai smoking and quaking? This is a representation of Yahweh himself cutting a covenant. On that day the Lord made, that's the NIV term, the Hebrew term, on that day the Lord cut a covenant. Abram cut the animals in two. God, with this smoking fire pot, walks between them and in so doing cuts a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants I give this land. Remember Abram said, I don't have a land. He said, I don't have children. He said, well, look up in the stars, and if you can count them, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham said, but I don't have a land. And he's saying, okay, I'm cutting this covenant, and to your descendants I give this land from uh, the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. And then he goes on to describe that land. Now, it's critical that we understand what's happening here. Okay, there is what Scripture says. God reassures Abram that uh, uh, what he's promised is actually going to take place. And so in the account, the animals are killed and divided by Abraham, and they are laid out. God speaks to Abram in this deep sleep, and he tells him what the future holds, so there won't be any surprise. Abram's not going to live to experience this, but those who did live can look back on this just as God does in Isaiah. You remember, constantly challenge the idols in Isaiah. Can you tell us what happened in the past and what that all means? Can you tell us what's going to happen in the future? No, you can't do that. None of you can tell what's going to happen. I'm the one that's told you that. So right here, God demonstrates who he is by telling them what is ahead. And here, God cuts a covenant with Abraham. Now think of this. Yahweh himself comes down and walks this bloody path between the severed halves of the animals. This covenant cuts deep. It's a bloody covenant. Now what's happening in all of this? 
Well, the walking through the divided bloody animals is what's called a self, a self maledictory oath. In other words, God is saying, if I don't keep the terms of this covenant, may what happened to these animals happen to me. May judgment come on me. Well, in fact, what's happening here is God alone accepts the responsibility for keeping this covenant. It's not Abram and him that go through that together, but God's going to do that. Abram will have a family and Abram will have the land as promised. And we know that because God seals it with this oath. Now, as the story continues, we come to chapter 17. 12 is important because it's the promise. 15 is important because that's where the covenant is cut. 17 is important because that's where the covenant is confirmed or reaffirmed, and what happens in chapter 17 is this covenant is not cut, it's uh, hakim is the Hebrew word, it's reestablished. And in chapter 17, Abram gets a new name. From Abram, the word ab or abba is the word for father. Abraham is the father of many nations. And so, as God gives this promise to him, he gets a new name. There's a new responsibility. This covenant now is going to be established and, and recognized by a covenant sign. And that sign is the sign of circumcision. So circumcision is introduced as a sign to uh, identify those who are part of it. And Abram is given the responsibility of circumcising his children, his sons, so that any that are not circumcised won't be part of the covenant people of God. And through this, he's promised a son, a son that's going to come through Sarah, not Hagar. You remember in the intervening uh, time, God said it's not going to be Eliezer. So Sarah came up with a real bright idea. Well, you take Hagar, my maid, and have a child by her. So he did. And after that happened, things didn't work out so well, as you remember. And yet God's working through all of this. And Abraham loves his son Ishmael. And he begs for God to bless him. And he says, I will, but that's not the seed through which this promise is going to come. Sarah is going to have a son. Now, you know the story. It's a bit problematic. Sarah is not a young chick at this point. She's 90 years old. Abraham now is 100 years old. And God says, no, you're going to have a son. Uh, you're going to have a son through Sarah. And he's the one that's going to carry this on. Well, as you go to chapter 18, you remember the three divine visitors that came and they met with Abram and Sarah is in the tent and they affirm once again that Sarah is going to have a son and Sarah laughs. Actually, it's Sarai still at this point. And she laughs and they said, why did you laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. And they said, yes, you did laugh. And of course, it seems impossible to her that at 90 years of age, she's going to have a son. But the promise is that she is going to bear a son in her old age, and Abraham is going to bear a son. Uh, he is going to be a daddy at 100 years old. Abraham is going to be the channel for God's blessing to the nations, and that is going to be channeled through the son that will be born, and uh, his name is Isaac. And then Isaac is going to have two sons, Jacob and Esau, and it's Jacob that the line is going to go through. And Jacob has 12 sons, and it's through Judah. So we see God directing that throughout. Abram, Abraham, now the seed Isaac, is going to be the source of God's blessing to all of the nations. And even here, it's very interesting, as a blessing to the nations, what does he do? He pleads for Sodom. 
these three messengers came to say Sodom is going to be destroyed, and he, Abram didn't say go get them. He pleaded, you know, if there are 50 righteous, 40, 30, and he finally gets down to 10, well, in the end, there's only a handful, and God destroys Sodom. But in many ways, it points out what Adam, or what Abram is going to do throughout, and Abraham is going to be the channel of blessing through which all of this is going to come. Well, we go on in the account we read about the birth of the heir. Isaac is really an answer to prayer. It's a miracle. It's according to promise. You can read the account in Galatians. Uh, and then we come to Genesis 22. And this is a, 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 a graphic, uh, vital story. God said to Abram, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to take him to a place I'll show you and sacrifice him. Whoa, what's happening here? In fact, Tim Keller has a very interesting section where it says it perhaps may be that Abraham has come to love his son now more than he loves the God who gave him his son, and this is going to be a test. And here is where Abraham's heart really comes through. And you know the story. He takes his son and he goes and he raises the knife to take his life. And God says, stop, now I know that you trust me. And there is a ram in the thicket. This is just drenched with typology. Everything about it is pointing forward to the day the Father in heaven is going to raise his knife to put that into his own son. But there's not going to be any hand that says, no, stop. And all of this is typological. It's pointing forward to that. God said, I will provide myself a ram. And it's more than just he's going to provide a ram for Abraham. He himself is going to be the ram. And in this passage, God himself swears. He swears by himself. Here's the strongest promise so far that you can count on this. Take it to the bank Everything that I've said is going to take place. Now, at the very center of what Abram is doing, Abraham is given the task of carrying out the mission of God. Now, think about this. This is not just Abraham's mission. This is God's mission. This is what God is doing through all of this. Now, we've run into God cursing already. He cursed Adam because of his sin. He cursed Eve because of her sin. He cursed the serpent. Cursing is not just using bad words that we throw at somebody when we're angry. Cursing in this sense is God's judgment against sin and the intentional misery that that, that, that judgment brings about. That is proper. That is not some kind of twisted, diabolical mind. That's what righteousness demands. But let me say this to you. The real heart of God is not in cursing. God curses because of sin. But God's heart is to bless. And I, I want to point out a resource to you that I got several years ago. This is called The Mission of God. It is by Christopher Wright. And he has a section in here. I want to refer to these things. We could spend uh, an hour going through this, but let me suggest that, and you may want to get that resource and follow up. What is the blessing of Abraham? What is the, 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 the mission that God has assigned to Abraham to be a blessing to the nations? And he says it's creational and relational. That is, the, the, the blessing that's going to come is going to affect creation. But it's also going to affect us relationally. It's going to reestablish the relational connection with God. It's going to be missional, and it's going to be historical. That is, that, that God has a mission, and that is that all the nations of the earth will know him and love him and bless him. And it's historical. It's going to be not just one place, but everywhere. At its heart, it's covenantal. 
God enters into a formal promise with his people, and that covenantal blessing has ethical dimensions. They are to walk before God in a certain way. And Christopher Wright points out that it's multinational and it's Christological. Multinational is that it includes all nations. Christological is that it all finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And when you think about Abraham, you have to think about the father of the promised seed, Jesus Christ, the seed that was promised. The two go hand in hand. So the mission that was assigned to Abraham is the mission that was picked up by Jesus Christ and accomplished in what he did and then is given to the church. So we are to make disciples of all the ethnos, the nations, that all ties together. You see the typology of this? You see how this all runs together? Abraham is the father of promise. Jesus Christ is the seed promised. That's the message of Romans chapter 4 that we read earlier. That's the message of Galatians chapter 3. I want to read a couple of these verses because they are so poignant and so powerful. We read in Genesis 3, uh, 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 I'm sorry, in Galatians chapter 3, uh, he redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And then he goes on to talk about, let me take an example from everyday life, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that's been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. What's he mean by seed? The scripture does not say, and to seeds, plural, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. It's all centered in Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise, but God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Do you hear that? We don't have different stories in the Bible, the old one and the new one. It is all one story. The writer to the book of Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 6. Verse 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by something greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be encouraged We have that hope as a veil, uh, as an anchor that's inside the veil. You see where this is going? Everything about Abraham is pointing forward to Jesus Christ. Well, where does that bring us as Christians? Where does that bring us as a church? Listen to me. The church is carrying on the mission that God gave to Abraham and he failed at, and Israel failed at, but Jesus, his son, didn't fail at, and now he gives it to us. As he went back to heaven, he ascended into heaven, and he went through the holy place, he finished that work of redemption, and then he sat down. You remember what he did? Then he sent the Spirit, and the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and the Spirit now is the field marshal that here is in the midst giving us the task 
of carrying out this mission of making God known. The glory of God is to be seen by all people. Our task is to make that known. See, the blessing, the, the mission of God is not just to save a few people scattered here and there. It's to bless all the nations of the world, all the ethnos. And you see Matthew 28? What's the Great Commission? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them all the things that I've commanded you to do. Now, friends, listen. If you're going to understand the Bible, and the Bible is necessary to understand what life is all about, this whole drama of redemption, if you miss this scene, the rest of this is going to be confusing. It's absolutely foundational that we see Abraham as the father that was promised an heir, as Jesus Christ, the heir that was promised, and see how all of these things fit together. What a glorious God we have. What a glorious uh, uh, plan of redemption as we see this story unfold. Now, I, I want to encourage you to go through the, uh, the assignments for this week. You'll see them on the, the sheet that you have in front of you. But there's one particularly I want to encourage you not to miss out on. There was an article uh, by uh, uh, a man that uh, Peter Gentry pointed out in his book, and I, you have a copy in your hand. I want you to take some time to carefully read through that. It gives a beautiful picture of what it was like that the eternal God, the glorious creator of everything, would condescend to come down like a smoking fire pot and walk between those bloody animals in order to rescue us. It tells you something about the heart of God and about Jesus Christ living, leaving the throne of glory and coming down to this earth, humbling himself to be a human being, humble himself to being a servant, humbling himself even to death on the cross. And the Spirit of God who takes that and every uh, single one of God's people, he takes that truth and he engraves it on our heart. What a glorious story of redemption. Just think of the opportunities that God gives to each one of us to tell this story. And when you see where Abraham fits in, it just makes it come to life. It makes it pop. I hope that you'll catch something of the passion that's in the heart of God as he tells the story of Abraham. And it's a story you won't keep to yourself but it's a story that you'll tell to others and you'll tell it often and you'll tell it with passion. Lord's blessings. Have a great week.